What's your name? Matthew Paris. <laughs> what are you doing here? What's your What's your purpose? My purpose is I'm going to talk about the short films, Crisis, Last Catch, My Mother's Eyes, and The Eyes on Me. And I'm going to talk about the writing process, and I'm going to talk about uh, the development, how we got distri uh, distributed, and all that fun stuff. It's going to be great. So you think you're somebody, huh? I think so. I think we're all somebody, <laughs> right? <laughs> So Crisis was uh, a movie I had written. I had wrote the script back in 2010, and I had just moved to Austin in October 2008. And when I got here, uh, I got involved in independent films, short films, and whatnot, just kind of having a good time. I ended up working behind the scenes uh, for a movie called Distances, which was a uh, feature independent film for Brandon Marshall. And I had a good time doing that, and uh, after that I started to do uh, a short film for Marion Yeager and my productions. And that was called The Good Samaritan, and I worked behind the scenes on that. That was a fun time. Uh, but how I came up with Crisis was I was, uh, I was laying down on the couch at home watching television, channel surfing, whatnot. And uh, I was kind of coming up with the idea of what to write next. And I thought, uh, well, why not have a guy who's struggling at home? He's a single guy. He's in his 30s um, and doesn't know. He wants to have a job but doesn't know how to get a job or the process. He has no connections. And that's how it kind of started. And um, basically, uh, there was a lot of uh, things going on that I was seeing on television and, and books and stuff like that and articles that these college kids were coming out of college but they couldn't find a job and they were kind of depressed about it and I was reading articles about this and uh, unless uh, a lot of them too would go on and work for their parents or work for their dad if they own the company but um, there, there are some kids that just don't have that luxury so they would you know be struggling to find a job so that's where it started. So I wrote a few pages of that and then it became something more of what if this guy was suicidal because the suicide rate is very high. And, uh, but I had to find a way to why was he so, so suicidal? What was, the, uh, what was the problem there? So I remember writing a few pages of that and writing scenes of him and his parents. This is the first draft of the script. Uh, him and his parents, and his parents kind of saying, look, you need to find a job. Uh, we can't support you. You're living off us. Why don't you act like a man? You know, go find a job. And he would say, well, I'm trying, I'm trying. That was the uh, original opening scene of the movie where he would go downstairs for breakfast. He was living at home. He was probably in his early 30s. And that's how it started. So basically you have a guy who, who's everybody in the world, including his friends and his parents are telling him, you gotta stop being lazy, which really he's not being lazy. He's really trying to find a job, but he, he doesn't know, nobody will take him on. So I need another angle to it where he needs to talk to somebody, because I think we all need to talk to somebody, especially nowadays. We all need someone in our corner. So uh, I remember working, when, at the time I was working for Round Rock Express Baseball, and I remember coming home from the ballpark, and I was driving back to Houston, <clears throat> excuse me, I was driving back to Houston, and this was like around midnight, I left the ballpark because I think we had a game or some sort of special event, and I remember uh, driving home on 71, uh, Total, total darkness of, of this highway and just driving home and I was listening to the radio and I was listening to this uh, I was listening to Delilah now if you don't know Delilah she's kind of like the Dr. Phil of radio she has people call in people say ask her about you know the problems do you have any advice for me and I kind of thought okay that's that's what happens he calls into his favorite radio station for help so he ends up talking to uh, this woman on, on the radio and says, look, you know, I try to find a job. I don't know what to do. Um, I just need somebody to talk to. And basically, he just needs someone to understand him. So at that time, I had written the scenes of the parents. Uh, I had written this, uh, a scene at the diner where he's talking to his buddies, old high school buddies, and they're all doing very successful, and he's not. And they're kind of giving him crap about it, not knowing that the guy is suicidal. And, uh, and then it kind of went from there. And then I brought in the angle of the radio station. He calls into the radio station. 
So I wrote the first draft, uh, I think in 2010, and it was just kind of sitting there. I had finished a short film. Now what happened was I was in talks to do a movie in New Orleans, a horror movie in New Orleans, that ended up falling through, like a lot of projects do. And basically, uh, I had hooked up with this producer, uh, Carlos, from uh, Look Now Productions. And after that movie fell through, he kind of asked me, he goes, you know, do you have anything for me? And I said, yeah, I have this script called Crisis. And it's just kind of sitting there. Do you want to read it? He said, yeah, send it over. So I sent him, I sent him the script. I sent him the first draft of the script. And he read it. And within a day, I'll never forget this, he, uh, he texted me back the next day. It said, and there was one word. He said, wow. And then he was like, we have to meet. We have to meet now. I love the script. Let's, let's talk about this. So I go and meet him for lunch. And uh, he basically said, okay, when do you want to shoot? Which never happens. You know, usually this whole thing is, is a process. You go through pre-production, you go through production, you go through post-production. So uh, he was just basically like, yeah, what days do you want to shoot? I thought, okay. Because I thought, driving to the restaurant, I thought he was going to be like, um, all right, here are my notes, which came later because I had to do a second and third draft. But he said, you know, when you want to shoot, and uh, later on, once we started the development process, he gave me some notes. He wanted to set it on Halloween night, which I thought was fine. And we made it a little bit more of a thriller, where the first draft was a little bit more of a talkie movie with a guy who just needed help. Uh, we made him a little bit more of a thriller. We made him a little bit more of a almost crazy, kind of a crazy guy and who kind of stalks the radio station a little bit, kind of stalks the woman uh, at the radio station. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's how, that's, that's how one script goes from one place and ends up to a whole nother place. Um, so I did a couple more drafts. We were casting the movie. We had looked at a few actors for the, for the role. Uh, the main role of Michael, the guy's name was Michael in Crisis. And uh, a lot of these guys, and this usually happens with young actors, where these guys come in and they want to know the psychology of the character. You know, did his parents abuse him or, or whatnot? If you're playing a guy who, who tends to, you know, be a little bit out there and a little bit crazy. And uh, so all those guys, I would talk to these guys and those guys just, just didn't fit the bill. And um, I got an email from this actor named Ken Stahl who said, uh, you know, I really want to play this role. I want to play the role of Michael in, in your movie. And uh, he, he was going through saying, you know, I have a college degree and, you know, I'm working this job and I don't like it very much. It's not very good pay. And, and so I know how this guy feels. And I said, great. And I remember going to Carlos, the producer, uh, thinking, okay, this is the guy. This guy, this guy truly gets it. He's not talking about the psychology of another person. And, and you know why is why is this what makes this guy tick he's just a guy who you know felt like he he's in trouble and he wants more in life and he doesn't know how to get it which is what the character i wrote in crisis was like um so we casted ken we he did an audition i think he said on tape i saw it the producer saw it and it was great so we we casted him and then we casted we rounded out the cast for his friends um shane christopher certainly david delal who's actually one of my favorite actors. He's one of the best actors I've, I've ever worked with. He's a really, really good actor, and he's gone on to do uh, some great things. I think he was in The Purge, the television show The Purge, and uh, I think he was in Better Call Sal. And um, so, yeah, uh, Laura Ritz was another one. So they were all great. And so we shot the movie. We shot in and around Austin. We shot at a coffee shop in East Austin. That, that was a lot of fun. The owner was, was great. Um, we did have about, I think, four days of shooting. I have to search my files again because we shot in 2011. So I think we had four days of shooting. Um, yeah, I briefly show up in it. We shot at this music studio down in South Austin. I briefly show up in it. That's a funny story because when we hired the director, Gray Ellis, he had a few notes and uh, he basically, the great guy, he basically, he's a really good editor too. And he basically brought his own own thing to it. And, um, you know, I remember uh, in the writing process, they were like, I, remember I was in a meeting and they were like, you know, Matt, we're going to put you in there. And at first I was like, no, no, I don't want to be in the movie. It was, it's fine. He said, no, 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 we'll, we'll put you in there. So 
I actually play a successful business guy who comes out of the, the office and the guy is making fun of me. The main character is making fun of me. So, um, yeah, it was fun. You know, I basically, I didn't have any lines. I basically walked from point A to point B. But it was great. You know, I'm, I'm walking back to my car in the parking lot scene. But it was great. And uh, so we, we shot the movie. We had one moment where we were shooting at a studio and we were shooting so late, the guy wanted to go home. And we were in the parking lot. And we were like, yeah, we, we have a few more shots here, man. We can't go home. So I honestly think, the guy was a young guy, so I honestly think he wanted to shut it down early and go out and party. But that's just me. Um, so we had a few more shots and we were gonna shoot the ending and we had to shoot the ending there. The problem was I kept on delaying it, telling them just give me 10, 15 more minutes then we'll be out of here. Now that 10, 15 minutes went to 20 minutes, and then it went to 25 minutes, and I could tell the guy was getting angry. So he basically kicked us out of the studio parking lot and because he had to close the gate. And we've pretty much filmed it what you call guerrilla style, which means you film at a location with no permits or you, you don't have really any permission to be there. But we had to do it because we had to finish the movie. We were on a tight deadline. So we had gone to this uh, parking lot at this middle school and there was nobody around and this was like in the dead of night you know we had like a bunch of crew members out there you know the actors are out there and uh, we had Ken out there we had Sky Dabney out there so uh, basically how we cheated it was we just kept all the shots tight tight on their face you know from the chest to the head and then we did close-ups just extreme close-ups that's how we did it we actually uh, there was one car, there was one truck that was parked there and the windows were dark and tinted and we were kind of like, what's going on here? So one of the crew members walked up to the truck and then the truck started and backed up and left. So I'm still trying to figure out what, what was going on there. I don't know what was going on there, so um, I'll just leave it at that. So, but anyways, we finished the movie and uh, everything was great. I remember, uh, I remember I said, look, if, if a police officer comes by or anything like that, we're all film students. The producer is the, is the film professor, and this is student film. That was my story in case uh, a police officer was going to come by. But luckily, no one came by. So we shot the movie, and then we were in the uh, editing process. Now, the editing process usually takes a little while because you got to do a first cut of the movie. Uh, this is with no music. You probably add temp music to it. And uh, because we were, we had to hire a composer to do the theme for Crisis, and uh, do the music for the movie. So, uh, so anyways, we uh, we're doing the editing process. We had had a first cut. We had talked about doing a focus group screen at one of the theaters, but I don't think we ever did. Um, so yeah, so we felt like we all felt like we had something good, um, and then we did a couple more cuts. And then we had the premiere at this place called Juju's Photo Gallery in East Austin, which is kind of a cool place, you know? It was uh, pretty awesome. Uh, we had a bunch of people show up. It was a packed house, that was kind of cool. One of my bosses from uh, I-9 Sports showed up because I told him about it at the time I was coaching for I-9 Sports. And uh, we got a big reaction from the crowd. After that came the process of marketing and distribution. Um, Gray Ellis, I think, had designed the poster, which is Ken's face with the gun on it. And uh, yeah, so we distributed the poster, we distributed it online. And then um, as far as film festivals go, it was, uh, I usually take a little bit of a different approach as opposed to other producers. The producers came to me and said, well, let's take it to the Cannes Film Festival or Sundance. I don't usually like to do that because if you think about it, every filmmaker in film school and in the world wants to go to Cannes and Sundance because those are the two biggest film festivals in the world. Um, so I usually go against that. I'm like, well, why not? I told the producers, why not go to smaller film festivals where maybe we can get an award, maybe we can build a crowd, a fan base there, and let's do that. So luckily, they went with me during that time. Now. There are a few ways to uh, market a movie uh, if you're doing an independent film and keeping the budget low and you don't have studio backing or distribution yet. Um, and it's, it's different in every, every way. Now, um, 
you, there's marketing, online marketing for movies called Without a Box, which a lot of people used at that time. Which I we didn't use it for that because I didn't want to use it for that because I had I had a strategy myself from marketing for I Nine Sports and 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 other sports organizations. So we basically uh, I went to this thing called Film Freeway, which I thought was a lot easier marketing strategy. A lot of filmmakers go to it to market their movies to festivals. So that's what I did. You put the movie up there. You, with a password protected because you don't want to get it out there and then you uh, put the trailer up there Which is what we did. I basically wrote out a marketing plan saying, you know, here's who's in it Here's who wrote it, which is me. Here's who produced it. Here's who directed it. So um, Basically you, you set it out to uh, film festivals and then we got to World Fest Houston. We won like the Platinum Remy at World Fest Houston. We uh, got to a few other festivals uh, we won, I think, the Rising Star Award at in Canada, Canadian International Film Festival. And then I think, no, actually, no, I'm sorry. That was the Royal Real Award. We won the Rising Star Award, I think, for uh, The Last Catch, which I'll get to. But we, we started winning these awards, and then uh, I thought to myself, okay, now we could, uh, we could try to go to distribution companies to sell the movie. Um, sometimes when a filmmaker... Uh, finish this a movie no matter if it's a short or a feature they just want to go straight to the distribution companies and I was telling everybody because they're overexcited they had just uh, made this thing and they want to try to get it out there so sometimes they put the cart before the horse for whatever reason and I said no no let's uh, let's take it to uh, let's build our audiences for uh, film festivals first so after we got about two awards um, I knew we were in the driver's seat and basically I said okay that's when we go to that's when we'll go to uh, distribution companies so basically I sent it I think to two distribution companies I know I sent it to one in Germany and they basically got back to me and said you know thanks Matt but you know it's not for us right now and we're, we're marketing these type of movies and I said that's fine that's cool and then I sent it off to uh, Shorts International I sent them the movie I sent them the trailer at that time the trailer was just released on YouTube so I had shared that on social media pages and that was kind of building word and saying, okay, what is this and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so after, after the festivals, after Film Freeway, um, I sent it to a few distribution companies. It was pretty much a no, which it didn't bother me because there's so many distribution outlets now for short films, no matter if it's airlines, no matter if it's streaming services, no matter if it's Amazon, no matter if it's Hulu. Um, and there's there's a bunch and uh, that's another thing too that independent producers have to realize you know sometimes they're like you know well I want to get my movie to a movie theater or I want to get my movie on Netflix you don't really need to uh, it's a win if you get your movie just out there somehow um, and even if it, you get paid for streaming services that's a win you know it's not out there with the uh, in the movie theaters playing next to Transformers but it's a win and I'll explain to people all the time, you know, you don't need a grand slam out of the gate. You could always have a few base hits. And uh, I think that's what we did with this movie. Um, so, basically, uh, I sent the movie off to Shorts International. I, I got them the poster, I got them the, uh, the trailer, and I got them the, uh, the movie. And, uh, uh, you know, a few other things too, like the cast and, and who wrote it, who produced it, and directed it. So, after about... I think after about two months I didn't hear anything and I just kind of thought okay well that one goes away let's just keep moving forward here because something's you know bound to hit and right when I said that I think the very next day or the, in the next two days I got a email from this uh, woman who's one of the executives over at Schwartz International in Los Angeles from Jenny and her name is Jenny Hayden and uh, I remember in the email she said you know I saw your movie last night I love the movie um, I would like to buy it and I was like, okay, great. So she sent us the contract. Uh, I looked over the contract. Um, I had my lawyers look over the contract. The producers looked over the contract. And everything looked good. So we, we signed the rights away to them. They said, here's what we want to do with the movie. We want to put it on television. We want to put it on uh, DirecTV and AT&T U-verse. And uh, it was a great relationship. Jenny's, Jenny's a wonderful woman. And, and uh, you know, I loved talking to her. I have never met her in person. I never went out to LA and met her in person, but I talked to her a bunch on the phone and, uh, and over emails and stuff, so it's always fun. 
And uh, so their strategy was we're going to put it on television, direct TV and AT&T Uverse. And I said, that's great. And they said, we're going to have it play over th uh, three continents, uh, including the United States. So it's going to be Europe, Middle East, Africa, and the United States. We thought that's great. So um, after about, uh, I say, because they needed the music rights too. So we had to get our composer to sign off on the music rights for the film. It, and the whole thing just became a, a big process. That took maybe another two months. So um, once we signed the deal and everything looked good and you know we got paid our little money um which is always nice uh we uh sent the film to them in a the drop link and and we asked them they said when when when's the movie going to premiere and they said well it's going to premiere on this day so it was great the funny thing though the funny thing is they had they had like a midnight premiere for the movie because it was a thriller and they sent it to the to the rate the rating company the rains board and they gave it a uh I think it was like 17 plus, which is basically Ray and R because it is a dark movie um, for short films. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, yeah, so we set the film. They premiered it on, I don't remember the dates, but they premiered it at like midnight. And then I think they had another showing of it like at 3 a.m. And I was thinking, everybody's going to be asleep here. So, like, nobody's going to see it. But, uh, yeah, so, but it played pretty well, you know, played a lot at night, 7 o'clock, the 8 o'clock crowd, because usually after about 6, they, and they explained this to us, Jenny explained this to us, they said after about 6, 7 o'clock is you, and later on in the night, you'll get the older, the older audience that like horror movies, the, that are horror fans, so that was their strategy, we're going to play it like at 10 o'clock at night, and that's what they did, I think they barely played it throughout the day, but a, a few times throughout the day, like around 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, but a lot of times it was at night and uh yeah it was great so we did that we were all having a good time and that's the uh that's the story of crisis it's a good movie so how the last catch happened was i had that story in my mind for about a year before i put it down on paper and after the success of Crisis and we sold the movie and everything was great with that, I remember I sat at the uh, the home of the producer. We were in the back porch having cigars, and he was like, "Do you have anything else that you know I could possibly produce?" And I said, "Yeah, I kind of have this thing, but I haven't put it down on paper yet. And it's very different than Crisis. It's about sports. It's kind of an inspirational movie." And he was like. Uh, he was like, yeah, well, you know, it, you don't have anything on paper? I said, yeah, but I basically told him the story. It's a father-son story. The dad has cancer. The father leaves his small Texas town, goes to plays college baseball, but comes back because his dad has cancer. And he has to, you know, talk to the father because they, they never got along and he pushed him real hard to play baseball. And he said, that sounds great. He goes, when do you think you'll have a first draft of script? I said, you know, give me about two weeks. So I went off and I wrote, it took me about, I think four days to write uh, about I think 18 pages of that movie so I think this was like 2012 2013 so I always wanted to do a sports film I mean obviously I'm a coach you when you're a coach you kind of you deal with a lot of uh, personality types you deal with you know fathers who push their kids real hard to play a sport or you know more fathers who want their kids to have fun but you'll see some of those hardcore dads so I thought, okay, what if I, what if I kind of, you know, write about that a little bit. So I basically went off, and the movie was also very in inspired by Field of Dreams, which is one of my favorite sports movies, which is about a, you know, a father and son type story on the baseball diamond in Iowa. So I went off, did the first draft, and they say, he said, okay, this is great, this is awesome. Um, we were looking for a director to do it. I originally wasn't going to direct the movie. So as the script went around, we had done, I had done a few more rewrites. Uh, we had talked to a few directors. We had talked to a few actors and, uh, you know, a lot of them like it, but they couldn't do it because they were doing another movie and their schedules were not open. So this movie, uh, other than Crisis, I mean, it, was, it took a long time to develop because I was doing drafts and we had to get actors who could fit the roles. So basically, we hired, uh, we, we hired a director 
And um, I remember he said, well, I want to do this and this. And then all of a sudden the guy just, he, he, it didn't work out because I think he wanted to do a rewrite and make it more this way. And we were like, no. So I remember being at a, I think it was Austin uh, Web Fest. And I remember being at, at a party up there at the Omni Hotel in downtown Austin. And one of the actresses we hired, uh, Joy, just said, Matt, why don't you direct it? Just have you direct it. And then the producer, Carlos, was there and said, yeah, why don't you do it? And, and at first, I never thought about directing. I didn't want to direct. You know, I had acted in a few things, and I had worked as an AD or, or writing or producing a little bit, but I never thought about directing. And uh, I thought to myself, okay, this will be an interesting challenge. I'll, I'll do it. So once they got me as director, we began uh, other cast, casting the movie. Now, we had already casted Joy as the mother, and she, jo uh, Joy Lee, and she's a great actress. I mean, she was awesome. She was great to work with. We had scouted locations. Um, we had looked at a few places. We had looked at the Sci Fair area, I think, in Houston. And then we looked at a bunch of houses around Austin. We needed much more of a rural kind of a country setting because we had we had to have a small town feel from the script. So uh, Carlos, the producer, had said, "Well, I have this friend who has a house in the country. Why don't we just go look at that?" Uh, and her name was Jacqueline. She's a very sweet lady, wonderful lady, and uh, still talk to her every once in a while. And um, so we went out to the house and it really fit what we needed from, you know, what was in the script, uh, you know, moving around the house. Because most of the movie takes place on one location. It takes place in a house and it takes place in the field in the back of the house. So we needed uh, those things and that's what this house had was those things. Plus it was a great house. I love the house. And it was out in uh, San Marcos, Texas. So we had scaled that location, we had secured that location, locked it down, uh, we made the dates on how to, uh, to when to shoot the movie, and uh, so we locked that down. So things were starting to get easier as, as it progressed. Um, yeah, we had casted this actor at first, um, I think his name was Ryan, I, I really, I don't even remember his name now, uh, haven't seen the guy in years, but I think his name was Ryan. And this guy fit the mold. He was like a model slash actor. He looked like an athlete. He looked like a college baseball player. So, and he was very excited to do it. So we had casted him and we had done like a photo shoot with them. We had done like, for the movie, we had done like certain things at the location uh, with him and Joy, who's playing his mother at the movie, uh, in the movie. And uh, we did all these photos with him and all these behind the scenes stuff and, and marketing materials to promote the movie with him. So I remember I sent out, I emailed him, sent out something saying, we're gonna shoot on these dates, it's gonna be great, you're gonna do good, just keep studying the script. Uh, and that night, I think it was like around 10.30 at night, he uh, said, hey, I'm so excited, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be awesome. Now at this time, he was also at college. I think he was living in Houston. He was going to uh, University of Houston. He was going to U of H. So, um, so yeah, but he said he could do the movie and we signed him and everything was locked. So he told me how excited he was uh, that night. The very next day, he uh, gives me a call. Or no, he doesn't give me a call. He, uh, he sends me an email or sends me a text. I can't remember if it was an email or a text since this was back in like 2012, 2013. And, um, he says, you know, Matt, uh, I can't do the movie now. And I was like, what do you mean you can't do the movie now? We we just did all this stuff with you. He goes, well, I'm going on uh, vacation. We had this vacation time, and it runs right into the movie's time. And, you know, my parents and I do this every year and, and whatnot. And I'm like, okay, how come you didn't tell me that, you know, two months ago when we were hiring you, and we did all this stuff, all this promotional stuff with you for the movie, at, you know, announcing you as a lead actor. So... Um, I honestly think he lied to me. I, I think somebody had persuaded him not to do the movie for whatever reason. I, I think it was that. So I think I think it was a lie. And I said, all right, man, bye. So I called the producers and told them what had happened. And the producers called him and kind of, you know, said some derogatory things to him, I'm sure. And uh, was kind. Of, I heard it was kind of a shouting match. I wasn't in the room. So um, after that, so... We didn't hire him anymore. He was gone. The search was on for a new lead actor. That's when uh, I think the very the same day that we talked about Ryan not coming to the movie, uh, Carlos, the producer, had sent me a uh, uh, a headshot of Bradley, 
and Bradley Costas. So we, I met with Bradley. We were, I think, a week away from shooting, and Bradley seemed like, you know, he, I think he had done like a video audition, and he, I saw his resume and headshot, and because I had to approve everything, and um, yeah, it was. Uh, he, I said, okay, he'll work. He, you know, I need to work with him, but he'll he'll be just fine. So from the day of shooting, um, or I'm sorry, actually, when this led up to to the day of shooting, I remember. We were rehearsing. We went out to the uh, house. We, you know, I told everybody, "Here's what I want to do." Because I was a director, also, I want these shots. I want that shot. We're gonna shoot this on this day. So basically, I wanted a four-day shoot. Basically, we were gonna do everything in the house on day one. We were gonna, or I'm sorry, we we're gonna do everything in in the, uh, the the main master kitchen and bedroom on day one. We were gonna do everything in the hallway on day two, and then day three, day four, we were gonna move outside. We we're gonna do all the the every in the front of the house, the front yard of the house. We we're gonna do on day three, and then do the ending, the 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 catch on day four. That was my original plan to shoot the movie. So as I was making the shot list and stuff like that. I went to the producers, the producers were like, no, no, we, we, we can't go out there for that long. I want two days. And I said, well, what do you mean? I was like, I need four days in order to do this right if you really want a, want a good movie. He said, no, no, no we, I, I can only give you two. And he never really explained why to me, which sometimes that happens when you're you know dealing with certain people. So, um, the, uh, so I got two days of shooting, and it was all kind of done very quickly. Um, the opening scene is uh, where they're driving down a long road in the countryside. It's one big master shot, and then I was I was kind of you know fought on that a little bit, and and uh, they they said well, why don't we do a shot like this? My original opening of script was it was one big master, and you track the car, and the car was coming towards the camera, and then you cut away to them pulling into the house, their front yard. How you see it in the movie is we actually had the DP and a few other crew members, camera guy, inside the car as they were driving. And then, you know, we had shots outside, a couple of actors inside the car, and then we cut to them coming to the camera, and then pull, and then, then them pulling into the driveway. But it originally was just a master shot of them just driving towards the camera and pulling into the driveway, uh, which is fine. You know, it's, a, it's always, I agree to it because you always need a, uh, you need ideas for the editing process of post-production. So I was fine with that. And it turned out well. I think it turned out well. So um, so after that, uh, we had two days worth of shooting. So basically, you have to do everything in the house, and then you have to do everything outside within those two days. So uh, what should have taken four days, you have to narrow down two days, which means you don't have a whole lot of setups that you need to do. Um, and not only that, you're kind of cut and pressed for times on budget and hours. So this was a real uh, learning experience as far as directing goes. I mean, it's it can be pretty stressful. So, anyways, we did everything in the house. We had one where uh, we had one shot where, you know, the the uh, son has to be angry at the father when he comes into the to the bedroom. So because the guy's dying of cancer. And then we build to, okay, I forgive you for pushing me so hard. I understand why you push me so hard to be, you know, to be really not only a great baseball player, but to really learn about life. Because in life you get knocked down, but you have to get back up, you know, and uh, just move forward. So um, there was a big speech with that, and he had to be really um, emotional stuff. Now, Bradley, I think, originally came from theater. He, I, I don't think he, I think this was one of his first movies, so we really had to work with him on it. And uh, there were a couple of times where we did like, I think seven or eight takes where he had to enter a room and uh, he was kind of playing it wrong. And I thought, no, 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 do this. It's more of an angry thing instead of a sad thing, which I think he was playing very sad. And then and then finally he, he was kind of getting with the rhythm. But uh and, and I love Bradley. I think Bradley's great. I think he's a great actor. He's just, you know, there are times where he goes really, really, he's very demonstrative. You know, he's very loud. He's very, he has a lot of energy, which is good, but sometimes you, somebody needs to tell him to bring him back down a little bit. So, um, but yeah, no, it was great. He did a great job. So I remember um, 
we were setting up outside to shoot the ending and uh, we were doing this the catch and basically what had happened was Bradley's not really a baseball player he's a swimmer he had grown up swimming so I had to really coach him on and a lot of us had to really coach him, coach him on how to actually throw a baseball and throw it pretty well and make it seem like he was a college player um, so it took a little time but he did he finally started to come around he did a great job so uh, we wrapped the movie Everything was great. Jackie, the, the owner of the house, Jackie was great. And uh, so, and we wrapped the movie. So, as we were going into post production, we had edited the movie. We had uh, had temp music. Ray Ellis, who directed Crisis, was also our editor on The Last Catch. And he did a great job. And yeah, I went in there. I said, okay, I want this, this, cut this together, and this. So, I was very, I was very dead set on my ideas and stuff like that. The problem is, usually with movies, you're dealing with a lot of people. So it's almost like, okay, you go in, we want this, you know, show of hands. It's very much like that. And it could, it could be quite frustrating. So it's a very kind of almost like a corporate entity. So um, we had a first cut, which I thought was okay. It wasn't terrific, but I thought it was okay. And we had a focus group screening over at AMC Barton Creek here in Austin. And uh, we did the screening and, you know, after you bring people in to watch the screening they fill out questionnaires about what they like and what they dislike about the movie so they come out of there and uh, they talk I've talked to a few about it. they said you know we like the story we think the story is strong uh, some of the actors are okay um, we you know I would we didn't really like this and this so it wasn't like it was high scores and it wasn't like it was low scores it was very kind of middle ground it was very mixed and you know you had some people who liked it some people who didn't like it and you're just kind of like okay well you know that's fine so uh i remember we had the, the producers wanted to see it and we had to turn in the first cut of the movie and i remember getting a call after they watch it and they pretty much said they they don't like the movie which was an interesting conversation and uh they were like, okay, we need to go back and shoot some things. And I, and I remember saying, I originally told you guys I wanted a four-day shoot, you know, and uh, which they didn't like too much, but, you know, we got through it. So um, I think we ended up shooting. We shot some exteriors on day three. We went back and shot a little bit of the ending. We went back and reshot uh, the catch a little bit from different angles. And uh, it turned out fine. And then we, uh, we edited the movie together. And then I think we had a, uh, I don't think we had any more focus group screenings. And we were going to have a premiere for it, we are going to try to find out, but this is what little faith some of the producers had in it, we didn't have a premiere for it. And I said, okay. So basically, the same marketing strategy and the same uh, that I took with Crisis, I went to Film Freeway, you know, built the marketing page on Film Freeway, and we went to, uh, we went to film festivals first. Uh, we went to World Fest Houston. We ended up winning the Silver Remy. Uh, we went to Canada. We got the Rising Star Award. We went to uh, the Digital Mation Awards, and we got nominated for I think Best Short Film Drama, and we actually ended up winning. Um, so I mean, so after all that, after the the uh, post production mess and all that, and people saying they, they don't really like it, they don't think it's going to work. Now we're winning all these awards at film festivals and everybody's coming up saying, hey, we love that movie, we think it's great. And it's very different than Crisis. Crisis was more of a thriller, where this was more of uh, the tearjerker. It was pulling on the heartstrings a little bit. So, and that's why I wanted to tell, it was very much a drama. Um, as a matter of fact, throughout the years, I've had people come up to me and say how much they really enjoy that movie, which is great to hear. Uh, so, anyways, after the after the, all the film festivals, after we were getting all the awards, um, we were starting to set out to distribution companies. Now, of course, Crisis was with Shorts International, and Jenny Hayden had really spearheaded Crisis. I contacted Jenny, and Jenny was like, "Sure, you know, uh, send it over, and I'll and I'll watch the movie." So I sent it over to her, not really know what she was going to say. Now I told Jenny on the phone, I said, it's very different than Crisis, it's not a thriller. And she was like, Matt, Matt, Matt. She goes, just send it over to me, let me watch it. And I said, okay. So, um, I think that day, or no, I'm sorry, it was the next day. The next day, she goes, this is great. I think this is fine. I think this works. I said, I'll, I'll buy it from you. 
So we went through that whole process again. I said, okay, great. So, you know, we went through the whole process of contracts. We got paid our money. It was a flat rate. We had no residuals from it, but it was fine. And uh, they said we're gonna do, it. we're gonna play it like we played, uh, like we played Crisis, which is over three continents, including the United States. So Europe, Middle East, Africa, and the United States. And um, it was on television. That one played a lot more throughout the day because it was much more of a family movie. And uh, yeah, it was great. I think a lot of people were surprised by that movie. I've had, throughout the years, I've had people come up to me and say how much they enjoy it. Um, yeah, it was a good movie. Um, as far as directing goes, I have not directed a movie since then because I kind of had, I, really what it was, was I did not get everything I wanted on that movie, including a few shots uh, due to budget reasons, due to time. Um, so I've not directed since, so I probably won't direct. So, uh, but it's fine, you know, it's cool. Um, as a matter of fact, the Utah, I think, film festival, uh, I think their critics reviewed The Last Catch and gave it like a great review, said it was a great movie, said, you know, really, it's an emotional punch to the gut, which is great, and uh, yeah, because it deals with father and sons and baseball, surrounding baseball. And I think everybody can relate to that in a way. Um, because, you know, I grew up playing sports. Uh, all my friends grew up playing sports. That's how you built friendships. That's how you built a team. And uh, to this day, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of my, uh, my sports buddies. I still talk to them this day. So it was a really good movie, and I'm very happy with it. So, yeah, it was awesome. So with the success of Crisis and The Last Catch, winning the awards and, and getting out there to the audience and playing on DirecTV and AT&T U-verse, uh, of course, Look Now Productions came to me and said, you know, do you have anything else for us? And uh, basically, I had just done a thriller with Crisis Forum, which was kind of a dark movie. I had done The Last Catch, was the tearjerker one. Um, so I wanted to do kind of my uh, chick flick one. So I had come up with the idea of what if you had a guy who was not the most popular guy in school, um, but he really liked this girl and she was part of the popular crowd. She was the cheerleader. She dated a certain type of guy um, and he was not that. He was, you know, the science geek and, and whatnot. So um, basically I came up with the idea of uh, a love story where you have a mother who uh, tells uh, the, a bedtime story to her child about how her and dad met. So I went off and I did a first draft of the script and uh, it was called My Mother's Eyes and basically uh, it was like I was really swinging for the fence with that movie. It was I, I was basically saying okay I want to do kind of a big budget um, uh, love story and I was probably a little bit naive at the time and uh, so I went off and wrote it and I basically wrote a first draft of the script and what had happened was you had the mother tell uh, the story to her daughter, a bedtime story to her daughter about how her and dad met. Uh, so we flashed back to high school and prom night and she was dating kind of the, uh, the most popular guy who was also kind of a jerk and he was kind of a loner and they kind of they met on you know they were classmates but he had asked her to prom because she had broken up with the other guy and she said yes and all her friends were like why are you dating this guy this is not who you date you know you date somebody like a johnny who's on the football team or something so um so yeah i kind of started from there uh the original setting was at the prom and uh, what had happened was uh, the, one of the main characters who, the, who was the bad guy, the antagonist of the, of the story was, the, uh, was uh, her ex-boyfriend. And he kind of always made fun of him and patronized him. And he kind of stands up for himself at the prom in front of everybody and they get into a fight a little bit and it kind of went from there. Uh, so I sent the first draft off to the producers and they all liked it. However, um, they said, okay, this is, you know, this is too much of a budget. We can't get to a school. We can't dr set dress the gym and stuff like that to do it. And we can't have tuxedos and stuff like that. He didn't quite say it like that, but I knew where he was going. 
So uh, basically it was just a big budget, we couldn't do it. Now I kind of knew that at the time, and uh, so like any type of rewrite on the script, you have to sometimes cave in for budget in order to film stuff and do stuff and just, you know, manage the money a little bit. So what had happened was I had did another rewrite and then I had done another rewrite and basically it went from the prom to a house party to them meeting at their favorite restaurant for a location to kind of hang out. It, 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 came, it went from being a prom date to having a first date with, with, this, uh, with this guy that she doesn't usually date, the main character doesn't usually date. So, um, and then I went there and then I did a couple of more drafts and we were starting to look at actors and actresses and stuff like that. Uh, what had happened was the producers were kind of like, well, I want to do it like this. Now, these are the type of producers that like horror movies and stuff like that. They don't do like hard stuff. So they're like, well, we want to do it like this and we want to do it like that. And I was getting kind of frustrated with the process. So after hiring a few actors and this and that and the other, and then we br they brought on another writer without telling me until after the fact to rewrite the script. And I read his draft and uh, it was way too much, you know, uh, of what I originally came up with. You know, of course he brought in his own thing to it, but it was just not the way to go. I, and I thought that. Um, and of course I very nicely said this to the producers and you know he got upset and then of course uh the writer found out that i didn't like it so of course he got upset so everything was kind of in a crossfires a little bit um so i did a couple more drafts of the script and i basically quit in pre-production i remember getting a call when i was out hanging out with a buddy of mine and one of the producers said well i hear you want to quit the movie now and he was like why and i said well look you know and at this time i had sent my original draft to my mother's eyes to the california film awards for literature and i got an award for it so and i explained this i said look i said i feel like there's too many cooks in the kitchen here that want to make it this where i'm meant to make it this way and it, and he understood and he, and, he, and he was like okay so they kind of still had me around for a little bit uh and then we hired a director, uh, Denise Bradley, who I absolutely love. Uh, her boyfriend was doing the sound mixing for my mother's eyes, Gary Robert Delgado. Uh, Denise, I don't think had ever directed before. She had been an actress. And uh, yeah, so she wanted to direct the movie. She asked the producers about it and stuff like that. And of course they asked me and I thought it was okay. I said, it's fine. And um, yeah, so that movie was just a pain and for me and uh, because they changed so much of the script around everybody did once Denise came on board to direct it she did a rewrite I think of the script uh, you know a lot of it was I think it was set at a house party but then a lot of it was also set at, uh, at the school too and it was just uh, it was not originally uh, what I wanted to do uh, the vision for what I had and the point I was trying to come across with that movie um, as a matter of fact, I remember the in the original, uh, the, I had a meeting with one of the producers and it was kind of a heated meeting and I said, look, it's not going to go anywhere without me. You know, it's not going to go to television, it's not, I said, the best thing it's going to go is probably YouTube. And of course he got mad. And um, so yeah, so Denise was hired, the crew was crewing up, they had shot a, uh, a, um, teaser trailer. I read like a little teaser trailer for it. They did do that. Uh, they shot that, which is what I wanted. So they, they filmed the, the ad of my script for the teaser trailer. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. I think you can find it on YouTube, My Mother's Eyes. And um, so they went off and did the movie. After pre-production, I really wasn't that, that involved because I pretty much said, guys, I'm out here because the script changed so much. So I did go to set for one day and just kind of looked around and it was kind of, I was like, all right. And uh, then I left. I thought, I remember uh, the one of the producers called me and said, well, I heard you were down there for one day. I said, yeah, I was there. He said, well, what'd you think? And I said, you know, it's okay. And he was kind of like, he was like, well, what does that mean, Matt? And I'm like, well, you know, I think they're doing, I think everything's going too quick. I think they're, they're not doing enough takes. They're not doing enough setups. They're not doing enough angles. And I said, that's what I think. And, uh, and he was just like, okay, so uh, they shot the movie and I was pretty much done with it. And um, I think they had uh, done post-production on it. They did send me a screener to the movie and I watched it. 
Um, so some of it, and I and I think Denise is great. I love Denise, but I I also think you know I, she did a good job directing it. Some of the actors in it don't usually match because Denise also played the lead of the mother, and then Alyssa was uh, the high school. Uh, when they, when we do the flashbacks of her in high school, she's a high school girl. So, and Alyssa did a great job because you know Alyssa's a great actress and model and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it was one of those things where some of the stuff didn't really match, and some of it sometimes some of it when I was watching it, it didn't really make sense, which where I which is where I knew it was going, and uh, and yeah, I heard the movie was on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, after I saw that movie, I just kind of said, well, you know, it is what it is, and here's what I think. It's funny enough, when I was uh, doing stuff around Rock Express Baseball, Denise and uh, Gary, her boyfriend, had gone out to a baseball game a couple times. I ran to her, and she pulled me aside for a second. She said, Matt, what, what did you really think about the movie? And I, I said, look, you did a good job. I just think there's certain I would have done it differently. And that's all I said to her. I said, you know, I would have done more setups. I would have done more takes. I would have done this a little bit more differently I would have moved the camera a little bit more just stuff like that and she understood she was cool and uh, you know we're still friends to this day and it's just another way to look at it but yeah that was kind of the movie that I lost a little bit and uh, I think you can find the movie on YouTube actually in my mother's eyes so and I think they only gave me story by credit which is fine so but that movie really didn't go anywhere as far as distribution or whatnot i think it just kind of went to youtube and and you know i quit you know pre-production and then i'd done a couple more drafts and then you know i really wasn't involved in the filmmaking of it so i kind of look at that one as the one that got away from me but you know these things happen you know writers come on board uh especially in hollywood it's standard practice if you write a script on spec and now if you don't know what spec is it's writing a script on speculation meaning that nobody hired you to write it, you just sat down and came up with the story yourself. And then you give it to a production company that might like it, and they usually say, well, we like it, we'll pay you this much for it, but we also we want to take it to our development department. And then that's when sometimes it kind of, it kind of hits you hard a little bit because everybody and their mother wants to throw in their two cents on the movie. And this is what happened right here. Where on the crisis and last catch, I had a little bit more creative freedom, and I was there uh, the whole time. So yeah, that's that's the story of my mother's eyes. So after my mother's eyes, I had taken a break from filming. I had just uh, I had taken a break from film uh, altogether. So. I had not written a while. I wrote. I went off and wrote a couple of books uh, over coaching because that's what I did. Um, I left I Nine Sports. I had gone off to coach soccer for FC Westlake. I had just stuck to sports. I was a program director for Austin Sports Academy for a little while. So that's what I was doing. I wasn't really doing anything uh, film-wise uh, right after my mother's eyes. So I think two years had gone by. And I met these uh, brothers, uh, Zane and Devin Van Cleef from Abrilio Films. And they had just moved to Austin. And they had done a short film that I watched that I, th I was really impressed by. I thought it was really, really good. I thought it was, it was really artsy, kind of dark a little bit. But I thought very well made um, as far as like the visuals and lighting and sound and, and all that stuff and the direction of the movie. So... Um, I had met these guys and hung out with them for a little bit and really got along with them and and uh, you know I told them I had written stuff too and there's a bug in here <laughs> I told them that I had written stuff too and basically they said oh well, that's great have you have you had any produced movies so I think they had seen Crisis and I think they yeah Zane had bought one of my books he bought The Light That Shines Upon the Players because at that time I had written two books one over coaching and one over athletics and sports. So one of the brothers, uh, Zane, actually bought the book, and he read it and he said, man, you're, you're a pretty good writer. I said, thanks, man, I appreciate it. I also think he read a couple of the articles I wrote for the sports column and, and whatnot. So he said, you know, uh, would you ever consider doing a screenplay for us? I said, sure. I said, I can, I'll can. i come up with some and, and do, do one for you guys. So I came up with a movie called The Eyes on Me, which was a thriller. 
Uh, it deals with kind of uh, stalking and and uh, and uh, not really being a good guy and dating and stuff like that and what happens if you get obsessed with with a woman and where does that go because I I had a with the whole Me Too movement and everything there was a uh, I had a friend who had gone through uh, a few sexual harassment experiences and domestic violence and whatnot so I kind of want to talk about that a little bit so basically I'd written a script it took me about two weeks to write it and um, gave it to them and they said, okay, this is, this is really good. And, and they, I heard back from them after three days saying, okay, we'll do it. And they had notes too, and I met with them, and they were the nicest guys. I mean, really the nicest guys. They're, they even told me, I think it was Devin, Devin who told me, um, who said, uh, you know, we haven't directed anyone else's script, so this will be a nice challenge for us. I said, that's great, man. That's, that's awesome. So um, this was one of the easiest movies to film, and I had a great time on it. It was very, very different than my mother's eyes. Um, the idea was we had gone off, we had a scout location to a house. So I had friends who had houses in Pflugerville, in Round Rock, in, in, in uh, I think Hutto? Yeah, Hutto. So um, we had scout locations at these different houses. And I went to uh, two of my friends who I used to work with out at the ballpark, and I said, and they knew I had written movies and done movies. I said, hey, you know, we need a house. How about we? I think your house would be perfect. How about we we set up a location scout, and I'll bring the filmmakers and producer stuff. And she said, that's great. So um, we went to the house, and directors loved it, and producers loved it, and I loved it, and I thought, yeah, let's uh, let's film here. Now the majority of the movie is is shot there with a few uh, scenes out on the street. So in the development process, in the casting process, uh, I got my first choice, which was great. It was uh, Tara Davis, um, which you know I wanted somebody who was very much the girl next door, and I think she fits that really well. Um, but also, you know, she's beautiful. She can walk into a bar and probably guys will look at her and try to hit on her and pick up her. So uh, I thought she fit she fit real well. I actually made a list of the five actresses who I do really well and who were doing commercials and stuff who could probably play that part. And she was the top of the list. So uh, I remember sending her the script and she read the script and she goes, I really, really like the script and like, it, you know, it affected me emotionally and stuff like that because I think she had some issues with dating and stuff like that. So. Um, so yeah, she said yes to it. Uh, she met with Devin and Zane Van Cleef. Uh, they thought they were great. And um, yeah. And then uh, the guy who was the stalker, the antagonist, that was a little har hard to find because there's a scene in there that kind of uh, where it's, it's almost a uh, kind of a domestic violence scene in there where he kind of pushes her and stuff like that. And there was a lot of actors we went to who didn't want to do that after they read that in the script. So that was a little harder to find. But anyways, we uh, we ended up casting uh, Brandon Box for it. He was great. We met, I think it was Devin and I met him at a, a barbecue joint here in Austin. And we had some delicious barbecue. We talked him through the script and said, this is why this guy is doing this and this, that, and the other. And we gave him kind of a background. I had written kind of a background uh information on his character and he agreed with it he, he was great i think he had just done a commercial i think he did a commercial for office depot or office max or staples i think i think it was an office supply store and he was telling us about it and i had kind of known him he was a coach too and he's an athletic guy so um i kind of known him uh from way back when not really realized he was acting and i found out he was an actor later after seeing his headshot is is real and stuff like that so we he was willing to do it. he said yes i think he was a little nervous about but we had talked talked him through it and uh he said yes and yeah we went out to the house uh got there early morning it was originally i think it was an eight page script so originally i talked to the man cleef brothers and said we could probably do this in two days and just do this 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 and this and they agreed with me and the call time we were out of the house early in the morning uh the crew was there. We had blacked out some of the house because we shot during the day and it was supposed to be night. So we had to black out some of the windows. And I know the owners of the house, Marilyn and Ron, uh, 
Marilyn Silva and Ron Silva had a great time just kind of because this is the first time they had a film at their house so I think they were really really excited about it and really really looking forward to it and uh, they were they were great to kind of listen there and they talked to the actors and all the actors were great to them um, so the interesting thing was I think Tara had something to do later that night and then it fell through and then I remember midday after after filming a lot of stuff in the house I said well why don't we try to get it all done in one day which is what we did which is unheard of so um, we had a nice little 17 hour eight I think 17 hour day I mean we shot well into the night when the sun went down so it was great the funny thing was Devin and Zane came up to me uh, and said well we want to put you in the movie kind of like a crisis deal and um, my original draft was I wasn't in the movie there was a guy who dropped her off and then she went into the house but the guy was kind of a douchebag but the thing is how I wrote it was you never saw the guy she just kind of uh, exited the car and we followed her all the way into the house and and you could tell and it comes through Tara's performance that she did a great job um, that the date did go very well. So uh, they said, well, Matt, why don't you play the douchebag? And I was like, well, I don't know. And they're like, no, 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 why don't you be the guy that plays the douchebag that drops her off and then you, you hit on her and then we see you. And I said, okay, well, that, that'd be fun. So it was a lot of fun to do that scene. As a matter of fact, um, Devin and Zane came to me as we were about to shoot the scene and I was kind of in my, you know, slacks and a button down shirt and khakis and everything. And uh, Zane came up to me and said, Matt, look, he goes, I know you're a running guy. You know, you like, you like to be exercised and be physically fit. What do you, how do you feel if you were smoking inside the car? And I was like, well, I'm not a big smoker, man. I don't smoke like anything, really. I might have a cigar if, if you know, a one night if, if I'm out hanging out. And I said, but I'm not a smoker. And he goes, no, I know, but I think it will fit your character well, add to the douchebag, you know, being a douchebag. I was like, so finally, after after a little bit of talking, I, I caved in and I said, sure. So, uh, but that was fun. You know, we shot the scene. We did about two takes. But a funny story is, uh, we shot the scene of me pulling up to the front of the house. And then we shot my side profile, which is where I lean out the window and I, as she's walking by, and I hit on her. I make a pass at her. And uh, I think the line was, you're the best, Jenny, which is in the movie. So, um... The main character's name is Jenny. So she, uh, I remember the first take we did, we did my profile. We shot the part where we roll up. We did the scene where she gets out of the car, Terry gets out of the car. And then we did a shot of me saying, you're the best, Jenny. Well, on the first take, I had the cigarette in my mouth. I see her walking and I'm like, <coughs> you're the best, Jenny. <coughs> so um, I'm coughing a little bit and it got a huge laugh from the directors and the, and the producers and, and the crew and everybody who was there who was filming that. So, and then of course the second and third take I did much better, it was much more clearer. So that's my little acting story, of one of my one line story. Um, but um, yeah, it was a lot of fun to do, very different than my mother's eyes. Uh, everybody was great on that movie, we got through it. Once we got to uh, post production, we had we had made the the uh, poster before we actually started shooting. Shooting and it was great, and then we um, we put the poster on IMDb. We uh, we made a trailer. The trailer was released on Vimeo. Uh, we shared it on social media sites, and people started to see it. Um, we did have a small little focus group screen with me. Uh, I think Devin was there. And I think, um, yeah, Brandon was there and the two lead actors there. Brandon and Tara were there. And uh, it was a packed house, and we showed it to a bunch of our friends at, at AMC Bark Creek Movie Theater. And, uh, yeah, it was. everybody came out. They said it was great. They said, we think it's really, really good. They said, it's, you know, it's dark here and there, but it's pretty good. Uh, after that, we had sent it off to film festivals. Um, we won some awards from it. And uh, yeah, we actually got reviewed in UK uh, Film Magazine, I think. And it was a pretty pretty good review, mixed review. And then we got reviewed again in, in another critics uh, magazine, and his was very mixed. I think he he thought you know this could have been done better and that could have been done better. And then we, uh, you know, I took it to Jenny. I took it back to Jenny, 
And I had talked to Jenny Hayden in a while. Now she, of course, was our distributor on Christ's the Last Catch. And then she got back to me. She goes, Matt, you know, with everything that's going on with, you know, uh, we're looking for more lighthearted stuff. That's what she told me. And I said, not a problem. Don't worry about it. So she said, I'm going to have to pass on this one. I said, okay, well, it's not a problem. So, but then we got a distribution deal after winning a few awards from the Independent Short Film Awards and the uh, X Indie Film Awards. And uh, we got a, a streaming service uh, distribution. So we're not on television, but we're on streaming services. I think on Exurb uh, Film. And it's a paying service, so you just go on, click on the movie. If you're if you're a subscriber and paying, then you can watch the movie. And I think the movie is pretty good. I think it holds up nicely. I think I've had people see it, say they really really like it. I remember I had one woman uh, who came to me who watched it and said, "Yeah, no, I, that happened to me once." And uh, I think it's very real. I think it's it's a good story, and she uh, she thought it was really good. So it was a. Uh, it was it was quite a fun film to make it, for it being a thriller. So yeah, that that's the eyes on me. It was a good movie. So with these three, or excuse me, four short films, um, they were all fun. They, I had a great time writing them. I had I was lucky enough to have people, producers and directors, interested in them to film them. Um, you know, they're all unique, they're all very different. One was a thriller, one was a, uh, a chick flick, one was a tearjerker, and then I went back to the thriller genre with the eyes on me. Um, the best advice I, get, I can say for any aspiring writer is, no matter if it's screenplays or books or anything like that, is you just write, man. You keep doing it. Um, set, you, some people set aside a time, one to four, to do it. Some people, uh, just do it on random. Sometimes I'm like that. I remember I had a college professor at Texas Tech who was like, well, you have to write every day. And I was like, yeah, but I mean, I don't know if I can write every day. Because the reality of it is sometimes writers have what you call writer's block, which is they'll sit in front of a computer or, or a screen and just they can't come up with anything. And I've had those days. I've had those days where I've sat in front of a screen and you know, I can't come up with anything. So I'll take two days off, and then I'll I'll have days where I sit in front of the screen, I can write 10 pages. Um, so yeah, uh, when you're telling a story, make sure you live life. You have to be able to live life. You can't just lock yourself in a room all day. Uh, go out, go out, hang out with your friends, have a great time, go, uh, go swimming, go, Go, uh, go for a run, go to a baseball game. Um, the biggest thing about writing is you have to be able to observe people too, observe what's around you, because that's how you build characters and that's how you uh, really build emotion within the character. So just be aware of your surroundings, have a great time, um, keep moving forward with it and you'll be successful at it. Um, now, if something doesn't hit right away with something, the greatest thing is there's always something else. So, um, the best thing to do is just not get frustrated, just keep moving forward. So yeah, I think that's what everybody needs to do about now. So um, this is Matthew Paris, I'm signing off. Uh, you guys keep writing, make those movies. Uh, I'm sure they're gonna be awesome, get it out there, because I'm sure people are uh, craving movies right now and good stories, uh, especially in times like these, just to kind of make them laugh, make them have a good time, something they can watch with their family and just have a great time. So I'll see you guys later. Take care. Bye.